welcome everyone. It's a great pleasure to to give this introduction and this give this presentation for for my book, which has the translated title "Evidence and Ethics: Beyond Evidence-Based Practice in Psychology." So I'm just going to give you a brief overview of my presentation. In the book, I spend three or four chapters introducing um, the philosophical underpinnings of evidence-based practice in psychology and evidence-based medicine, which is a core uh, influence in evidence-based practice in psychology. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time introducing the background. So I'm gonna focus on the second part of my book, which concerns itself with my criticisms of evidence-based practice in psychology. Right, but just as a starter, you know, um, I think it's important to establish that psychology and psychotherapy matters. So it matters to our understanding of ourselves and others. It matters to our understanding of our very most intimate relationships as uh, and they are described you know in attachment theory and uh, describing the emotional bond between a caregiver and an, and an infant but also you know in in um, occupational settings like uh, which is described in work psychology and and also clinical psychology which will be the main focus of of this presentation um, there is also something uh, important to be said with regards to psychology and good ends. So psychological science typically establishes effective means of various sorts. However, the good ends are often implicit in the various psychological theories. So if we take an example of theories describing uh, aggression, they have an implicit goal to reduce aggression. However, um, ethics is needed to describe why this is a good aim. So you need another kind of reasoning. And this is fairly important, as I hope will be clear during my, my presentation. Uh, another reason for thinking critically and um, at a very basic level about psychotherapy is that, you know, quite often the stakes are very high. And uh, sadly, that becomes uh, very apparent and kind of obvious if you turn to the history and historical practices in psychiatry and psychology. And I'll give you a, a very dramatic and serious uh, example. It's not melodramatic because this is quite real, um, which is drapetomania or the so-called fleeing disease. And I quote directly, this is about drapetomania or the fleeing disease. It is unknown to our medical authorities, although its diagnostic symptom, the absconding from service, is well known to our planters and overseas. In noticing a disease not heretofore classed among the long list of maladies that man is subject to, it was necessary to have a new term to express it. The cause in the most cases that induces the slave to run away from service is as much a disease of the mind as any other species of mental alienation and much more curable as a general rule. With the advantage of proper medical advice strictly followed, this troublesome practice that many slaves have of running away can be almost entirely prevented. So what this example shows in a disgusting way is uh, what kind of practices that becomes possible without a thorough ethical reflection on the part of the application of psychological theory. Okay, um, so I'll just turn very briefly to evidence-based medicine, which is a very important background for evidence-based practice in psychology. 
And evidence-based medicine was a concept that was used uh, more or less formally during the 80s. And in 1992, a group of researchers from Canada um, wrote a piece, an article, where they sort of launched this new paradigm. And I quote them, a new paradigm for medical practice is emerging. Evidence-based medicine de-emphasizes intuition, unsystematic clinical experience, and pathophysiologic rationale as sufficient grounds for clinical decision-making and stresses the ex examination of evidence from clinical research. So what they want to do is they want to tie um, a neater bond between uh, scientific evidence and clinical practice. That's the point of departure. Uh, and one means of doing that is to introduce the evidence hierarchy, which is illustrated here. There are many evidence hierarchies, but uh, kind of invariantly, randomized control trials and systematic reviews, uh, compiling many randomized control trials are at the top. And at the bottom, you'd find uh, case reports, case series, and clinical uh, expert opinion, clinical observation. Now, um, during the 90s, this model is criticized and expanded to include not only evidence, uh, best evidence, but also clinical expertise and patient values. So we have a tree per type model. Um, somewhat surprisingly, many would say, this model becomes very, very influential and popular and it gets expanded to all sorts of domains, not only health domains like psychology and nursing and social work, but even to politics. So you get evidence-based policy. And uh, my two favorites, uh, evidence-based alternative medicine and evidence-based research. So it's, um, it's a kind of concept that's uh, you can find all around in different um, domains and societies, so to speak. Um, and also evidence-based um, psychology, which is, of course, the main topic of today. Now, the definition of evidence-based practice in psychology is the integration of best available research with clinical expertise in the context of patient characteristics, culture, and preferences. And in the policy statement, um, the, the authors explicitly refer to evidence-based medicine um, in the way Sackett et al. define it. This is created in 2005 by the American Psychological Association and adopted by the Norwegian Psychological Association in 2007. And it, you know, it's the authoritative way to regulate the use of psychological knowledge, uh, most typically, of course, psychotherapy, but not exclusively. Okay, so I've structured my critique in four sections, um, as you'll see. Um, and this is my, my first, first critique of evidence-based uh, practice in, in psychology. And as a point of departure, as a start of my critique, I think it's um, expedient to go to the tradition called phenomenology. And if you look at the etymology of phenomenology as one of the most prominent uh, thinkers in the phenomenological tradition does, namely Martin Heidegger, it literally means the study of that which appears. The study of that which appears. And that takes us to a very basic notion of the relationship between scientific models and reality. So scientific models are simplifications of a very complex reality. In fact, in a sense, that's the very function of a scientific model. 
And as you can see here at this um, illustration, you know, the world is three dimensional, it's fairly complex, not perhaps uh, the best illustration of the complexity of the world, but you probably get my point. And at the map, you know, the, all the colors are um, unequivocal. They have a, a red line means, you know, main road, blue means sea or water at least, and so on. So the very function of a map is to simplify uh, the complex reality, as is the function of, of science. And this is, uh, in my opinion at least, beautifully described in a very short story by the Argentinian uh, novelist Jorge Luis Borges in a story called On Exactitude in Science. And this is the whole story and I read it for you. And this is how it goes. Um, in that empire, the art of cartography attained such perfection that the map of a single province occupied the entirety of a city and the map of the empire, the entirety of a province. In time, those unconscionable maps no longer satisfied and the cartographer guilds struck a map of the empire whose size was that of the empire and which coincided point for point with it. The following generation, who were not so fond of the study of cartography as their forebears had been, saw that that RASP map was useless and not with some pitilessness was it, that they delivered it up to the inclemencies of sun and winters. In the desert of the West, still today, there are tattered ruins of that map, inhabited by animals and beggars. In all the land, there is no other relic of the disciplines of geography. So I think the bottom line, the point of this story is twofold. So in a way, science has to uh, be conceptualized as a simplification, as a model of external reality, or else it will be misunderstood in a way. But the other aspect of the story is that um, it's in science interest to be understand, understood as a simplification. So, or, or else it will lead to the discrediting of science in a sense. So I think this is a brilliant, brilliant description of both points. Now let's turn back to psychotherapy and psychotherapy practice and look at what actually appears using the method of phenomenology. Well, what's striking about psychotherapy practice is that patients' speech acts are full of evaluations. And this might be Hollywood versions of what actual patients actually say, but they're not too far away from it, I think. So they say stuff like, I could, a good son would visit his mum more often, or I don't want to become mad. Secondly, therapists' speech acts are full of evaluations too. Do you think life would be easier without your anger? Or the idea of dying is painful to most people. Going from, from that which appears, you can try to do a bit of analyzing by distinguishing between two different kinds of utterances. And this is, of course, an ideal distinction, not one that you expect to find in the real world of everyday life. Nonetheless, it's useful to sort of highlight some differences. So at the one hand, you have descriptive utterances describing what the world is like, like the cat is on the map. At the other hand, you have normative utterances describing how the world should be like, people should be treated with respect, regardless of whether they are or not, right? And if we use that distinction, it's fairly evident <laughs> that psychotherapy is a normative practice. So the basic premise, in a sense, of psychotherapy is to change the patient's behavior, thoughts, and or emotions, right? 
That's the basic aim of psychotherapy. So psychotherapy's premise is that, talking very generally, some ways of living are preferable to others. And typically, that a life without psychiatric disease is preferable to a life with psychiatric disease, or at least that you have a different relationship to, to the psychiatric disease. Not that it's more valuable, but you, if you engage with psychotherapy, you try to change your, your symptoms in a way, no? So we use this um, analysis to critique evidence-based practice, arguing that evidence-based practice represents a scientism. And scientism is the belief that only science can provide legitimate knowledge. However, some questions are trans-scientific. There are questions that are scientific, but they're not answerable by science alone. Like, for instance, how should health resources be allocated? It's useful to deploy science when you answer that question, but you can't answer it by using science alone. And some questions simply just transcend science. They are non-scientific as, you know, the, the question of the worth of human life. At least that's my, my opinion. What we argue then is that the scientific conception of psychotherapy fails to recognize that the different psychotherapy schools are, represents different ethoses. So they're all based on normative underpinnings, giving different kinds of answers to questions like, what is the good life? What is the nature of, of suffering and the sources of suffering? What is the relationship between an individual and other human beings? What is a good development and what characterizes a good outcome in, in therapy? Right. Now I turn to, to the second uh, critique of the book and to start analyzing or presenting the second critique, uh, critique the notion of demar demarcation is fairly central. So to de demarcate means to fixate the boundaries of something, of anything. And I argue that there are three demarcations at work in evidence-based practice in psychology. So the most clear one is a practical demarcation, distinguishing between legitimate and illegitimate practice. So evidence-based practice in psychology is legitimate practice and other practices are illeg illegitimate. Secondly, um, there is an epistemic demarcation distinguishing between science and non-science. And as you can imagine, there is an intimate relationship between the epistemic demarcation and the practical demarcation, as the very term evidence-based practice, of course, um, denotes. What's very important, however, is that there is a third demarcation. And this is not an intended demarcation, it's an implicit one. And the implicit demarcation is an ethical demarcation. So what I'm arguing then is that there is a third unintended demarcation with ethical consequences for the understanding of best uh, psychotherapy practice. And to understand um, how it can become an implicit um, demarcation, I've used the term, the bureau bureaucratic model, which I've landed from um, the moral philosopher, uh, Alistair McIntyre. And McIntyre argues 
so long that philosophical theories in fact inform and guide the actions of men who take themselves to be hard-headed, pragmatically oriented, free of theory and guided by common sense. Such theories enjoy an undeserved power. So there is a tendency in contemporary bureaucracies to sort of neutralize ethical presupposition. That's what McIntyre argues. And the consequence is that, you know, evidence-based practice has a deceptive appearance of ethical neutrality. However, it is structured to real realize a specific notion of the good. And the ethical tradition, which discusses and presents various theories of different versions of the good or notions of the good is normative ethics. So we need, in a sense, normative ethics to analyze and understand evidence-based practice in psychology. And what I go on to argue is that evidence-based practice in psychology is structured as a utilitarian uh, ethics. And utilitarianism is a, you know, it's a broad school, um, including various kinds of thinkers, but typically it's consequentialist. So it, the good is um, assessed after, you know, according to the consequences of actions. It's universalistic and universalistic and egalitarian. So it doesn't matter who you are. And also typically it's hedonistic or perfectionistic. Uh, it focuses on pleasure or, and it can be more or less centralized, uh, focused on, on human actors in perfectionistic utilitarian theories. But there is a, a, a deeper kind of relationship between utilitarian uh, thought and evidence-based practice in psychology too. And there are some quotes from perhaps the most well-known utilitarian thinker, John Stuart Mill, that uh, illustrates the deep kind of affinity. Uh, and Mill argues, the positive evils of life, the great sources of physical and mental suffering are in themselves removable if human affairs continue to improve. How are they to improve, one could ask? Through the wisdom of society and through progress of science. So there is a basic presupposition in most utilitarian thought that if you base your policies on science, you will be able to reduce, marginalize and even efface um, suffering. What I go on to, to do is that I try to illustrate some of the alarming consequences of the ethical demarcation in evidence-based practice in psychology by using this case uh, of internet-based guided self-help treatments, which are self-help treatments given over the internet with a guide or help of a um, healthcare professional. Um, they are generally for quite a few uh, psychiatric diagnoses as effective as face-to-face -face treatments and of course potentially they are very very cost effective. Now what I try to do is then I show through um, analyzing that way of um, delivering psychotherapy services, which um, is very much in line with utilitarian ethics. If you analyze it, analyze it in three alternative ethical perspectives, you can see new kinds of ethical issues arising. And what this illustrates, I think, is that you need um, a, plural, a plurality of ethical perspectives to analyze various psychotherapy practices. 
which is very, very important, I, I believe. Right, um, so now I turn to my third critique. So there is a um, presupposition, as I mentioned before, in evidence-based practice in psychology, that it consists of three independent constituents or parts, right? So it's best available research, that's one part, clinical expertise is another part, and patient characteristics, culture and preferences is the third part. And in the integration of these three constituents, you find evidence-based practice in psychology. However, when you scrutinize the policy statement, um, you can see that, in fact, it doesn't actually consist of three independent constituents. In reality, it only consists of one constituent, best available research, and two subcategories specifying uh, different domains of psychotherapy research, namely um, research on the clinical expert, clinical expertise, and on the patient characteristics. And this is, of course, uh, a very serious limitation, a conceptual flaw. Uh, I think it's important to ask the question, how evidence-based practice in psychology could become um, scientocentric, how it could become unipartite, because the intention clearly was to make a tripartite model, right? Uh, well, in medical practice, the three uh, parts of evidence-based medicine, they're not so difficult to discern. So it's fairly easy to distinguish best evidence on the one hand and clinical expertise on the other and the, and the third uh, part, patient values um, from, from each other. However, in, in psychotherapy, actually some of the major factors associated with go good therapy, effective therapy, are clinical expertise, patient characteristics, culture and preferences. So when you look at, you know, um, psychotherapy research, it's no wonder that they've uh, mixed this up in a sense. And if you look at this um, illustration, you can see that, you know, the therapeutic relationship explains 30% of the variance and client variables explains 40% of the variance in outcome. So this is a substantial part of what actually makes psychotherapy works in itself a very <laughs> problematic notion, but let's just leave that in this, in this session. So what you have to do then is that you have to try to go from, you know, I'll go back from this model a uni unipartite model into this one, a genuinely tripartite model, right? That's the aim. If you go to, to the policy statement, it argues that, you know, clinical expertise is informed by scientific expertise as the EBP practitioner tests and hypotheses and interventions in practice as a local clinical sci scientist. So it's sort of modeled on a scientific rationality as well. However, you know, the typical models of expertise argues that, you know, an expert transcends propositional knowledge. So once you become an expert, you, you become more flexible. You're not rule bound anymore. You can adapt your interventions to various contexts. You have to base, you can base yourself on tacit knowledge generated over hours and hours of of practice in a sense. So the nature of expertise in a sense is precisely that it transcends propositional knowledge. 
Uh, you have the same kind of issues with uh, patient characteristics, cultural preferences, which are shaped by empirical findings, as I've said before. And now I quote the, the policy statement. Um, there is a growing empirical literature related to human diversity, which makes an understanding of patient characteristics like values, religious beliefs, worldviews, goals and preferences essential to evidence-based practice in psychology. Um, I argue, on the other hand, that you know, the ultimate aim for including patient preferences is that you want to stimulate patient autonomy. So you want patients to be able to decide for themselves. Um, you don't want to include patient preferences because it makes your uh, interventions more effective or patient autonomy, which is more comprehensive than patient preferences, is an end in itself, regardless of whether it leads to more effective uh, services. Right, so that's the third critique. And this is the fourth and, and final critique. And it deals with the notion of integration. So evidence-based practice is the integration of best available research with clinical expertise and patient characteristics, culture and preferences. So it entails some sort of integration. Um, I think it begs the question, um, who is the one doing the integration? Well, um, that ought to be the clinical expert, right? But if it's the clinical expert, um, it needs to have some kind of integrating capacities. So in order for the clinical expert to be able to have some capacities that enables them, that makes it to, to do the practice, right? And uh, to get these, um, to, to sort of try to describe these capacities, I've turned to virtue ethics. Uh, and a virtue is um, a capacity a person have to reach a certain end. And if we contextualize this to psychotherapy, we could say that a virtuous clinical expert has the capacity to reach the end of a good or improved or better life for a given patient, right? which is the ultimate aim of, of psychotherapy. You know? So um, goodness or rightness in virtue ethics uh, is defined according to the source of the action, which are properties of persons. So we have to try to describe some properties of persons, or more precisely, the, the clinical expert in, in this case. Um, what are virtues? if we are to say something more about them, they are in a sense, deep-rooted excellences that exceed mere skills. So they are deep-rooted within the character of the, of the actor. As I've said, the, they enable the person possessing them to bring about a good end and they counter therapeutic vices in a sense. So they discipline um, the, the clinical expert. What we can imagine then is virtues in the integrator in clinical experts corresponding to the three parts of evidence-based practice. So to the extent that the integration will be, um, you know, executed by a clinical expert the very same capacities have to be um, present in, in the clinical expert. No? 
Um, so in describing the virtues corresponding to the three parts of evidence-based practice, you know, best available research becomes epistemic virtues, virtues of knowledge. Clinical expertise becomes self-reflexive -refle virtues, virtues regarding understanding of oneself as an expert. And patient preferences become uh, becomes relational virtues. So these are the capacities that the clinical expert must have. Well, there is a very important, you could call it an overarching capacity as well, which in um, virtue ethics is normally coined practical wisdom. And practical wisdom is an indispensable meta virtue because it's sort of a guide to the right way of acting with respect to all the other virtues. So it's actually basically knowing what to do in a particular situation. That's the very particular skill that you have if you have practical wisdom. So what you're able to do in a very good way if you have practical wisdom as a clinical expert is that you're able to actually integrate best available research, clinical expertise and patient characteristics, culture and preferences in a, in a given uh, clinical situation, you know, which is always particular in a sense. Right, so um, to, to wrap this up, um, my, my four critiques are, you know, uh, that evidence-based practice fails to conceptualize psychotherapy correctly, that is, as a normative practice. Evidence-based practice in psychology, moreover, has unintended effects and it marginalizes ethical thinking in psychotherapy. It is conceptually flawed because it's not genuinely a tripartite model. And finally, it lacks the resources to understand the nature of integration, which I have tried to describe as therapeutic virtues. Yes, so I think that's um, it from, from me.